The War of 1812 had left America's financial house in shambles, so much so that then-President Madison was persuaded to allow a second central bank to be established. It might be a good idea to look at what was going on behind the scenes at this point. The two richest men in America at the time were Stephen Gerard and John Jacob Astor. The Astor family is best known for its real estate, but John Jacob made his fortune first in fur trading and opium. Hmm, Gerard looks like he could use a hat. In current U.S. dollars, these men would have been twice as wealthy as Bill Gates. Gerard and Astor both held large shares in Hamilton's first national bank of the U.S., and after it was shut down, the two men used their influence to promote Alexander Dallas to the post of Treasury Secretary. Dallas used his position to push through a new central bank, which Gerard and Astor would be major stockholders in as well. The second national bank of the U.S. would not last any longer than the first, however, for in the election of 1828, war hero Andrew Jackson ran on an anti-bank platform and won. As president, addressing a delegation of bankers, he famously said, You are a den of vipers and thieves. I intend to rout you out, and by the grace of the eternal God, I will rout you out. When Congress approved a bill to recharter the bank in 1832, Jackson vetoed it. Why all the fuss? Why were men like Jackson and Jefferson so opposed to a central bank? Because the ability to control the currency of a nation is the ability to control the nation itself. In the words of James Garfield, whoever controls the volume of money in any country is absolute master of all industry and commerce. It is easy to see the danger inherent in this power falling into private hands when one realizes that with it comes the ability to create booms and busts at will. The present crisis was intended. Insider Richard C. Cook goes so far as to say, They did it on purpose. The housing bubble and its crash were engineered from the highest levels of the U.S. government, the Federal Reserve, and the financial industry. As for the crash of 1929, Ben Bernanke himself spilled the beans at a banquet in 2002. It is doubtful that the private owners of the Fed were ever sorry, however. These booms and busts over the years have all been precipitated for a reason, to redistribute wealth. During booms, wealth gravitates upward due to inflation. Even before a currency collapses, the damage done by a fiat system is significant. Our monetary system insidiously transfers wealth from the poor and the middle class to the privileged rich. Those who benefit the most are the ones who get to use the newly created credit first. And following crashes, the most powerful companies snatch up assets and competitors for nickels on the dollar. Lehman Brothers has filed for bankruptcy. Wells Fargo will become the largest U.S. bank by branches with an $11.7 billion offer for rival Wachovia. Merrill Lynch, the world's biggest brokerage, has been bought by Bank of America. Washington Mutual has gone under. The FDIC then turned around and sold WAMU's thrift banking assets to J.P. Morgan Chase. This hat trick has been repeated by the world's top businessmen so many times it is a wonder that booms and busts are universally perceived as unintended. But the truth of the matter is, nearly every economic crisis in American history has been engineered, and there have been many. Two factors contributed to the Rothschild banking family's success. One was their ability to take advantage of financial panics. Maybe more significant was their talent for creating alliances. John Jacob Astor employed an agent, Jacob B. Taylor, to make his real estate deals in order to conceal his identity. Nathan Rothschild and his son Lionel used the same tact. In fact, their American agent during this period was Taylor's own son, Moses. After Jackson shut down the Second National Bank, the National City Bank of New York grew to prominence. Moses Taylor, with Rothschild backing and by buying up shares during the panics of 1837 and 1857, took it over. Reorganized from the ashes of Hamilton's first national bank in 1812, National City's list of presidents, directors, and stockholders over the years is a veritable who's who of American finance. It was the first and primary investor bank in the Federal Reserve and remains one of America's biggest banks to this day, albeit under a slightly different name. A 1976 congressional report identified three Rothschild subsidiaries in the U.S. The National City Bank of Cleveland, the First City Bank of Houston, and the First National Bank of Seattle. Allegedly, the word city in the names of these banks is a reference to the city. The city is the financial district located in the center of London. Sometimes called the square mile, it is actually a sovereign state much like the Vatican and maintains its own police force. The city has been the center of world banking since the days of the Western world's first multinational bankers, the Knights Templar. 
Eight hundred years ago, the Templar Knights built the Crown Temple Church there and made it their home, and England's financial and legal institutions grew up around it. You can find the Templar Knights' familiar red cross on the city's coat of arms. For that matter, the Cross of St. George, as it is known, is also a part of the British flag. The city is home to the Bank of England, the Royal Exchange, the London Stock Exchange, the Royal Courts of Justice, and many other financial and legal institutions. National City Bank of New York was originally just called Citibank, as was its sister, the City Bank of Cleveland. They both became national banks in 1865 when they received charters to print U.S. national currency. This was the same year that Lincoln, who had been issuing his own currency, the greenback, was assassinated. What was the difference between the greenbacks that Lincoln printed during the Civil War and the national currency banks like Citibank printed in their place? Banks had been printing a muddled variety of currencies as long as there had been banks in the U.S. Paper currency was ostensibly backed by some amount of gold or silver and loaned out at interest. After the Civil War, many large banks were allowed to issue a national currency for the first time. This was a big step toward the elite's goal of recreating a national central bank. Lincoln's greenbacks, on the other hand, were issued by the Treasury and were interest-free. The greenback threatened to cut the banks out of the whole currency racket. They killed him for it. Only one other president in U.S. history has tried to issue interest-free Treasury notes. They killed him, too. America in the mid-19th century was marked by rapid Western expansion, and that meant railroads. In the decade between 1860 and 1870, over 20,000 miles of track were laid, linking east to west and providing a way to move grain and cattle from the middle of the continent to the growing cities. All of this development required capital. Investors were more than willing to make loans, not just to turn a profit, but to get their foot in the door of the exploding American economy. The Rothschilds were no exception. In fact, they were pioneers in the financing of railroads on the other side of the Atlantic. Another Rothschild associate got in on the ground floor of one of America's first railroads, the B&O, a man by the name of George Peabody. Peabody was taken under the Rothschild wing in the 1830s and opened an office in London. He quickly became the go-to guy for British investors interested in American ventures and dealt in U.S. and state bonds, canals, transatlantic cable and railroads, and even shipped steel to the U.S. for laying track. But Peabody and Company's involvement in the American Railroad would really shift into high gear after Peabody retired and turned his company over to his partner, Junius Morgan, in 1864. The company was renamed J.S. Morgan and & Company, and Junius' son, John Pierpont Morgan, backed by unlimited Rothschild funds, would become the most powerful banker in the United States. Not only is the Morgan name familiar to every American, so is his likeness.